Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of High Energy Girl. Today's awesome guest is Dr. Michael Biamonte, who is one of the leading health experts in Candida, which is a fungal infection caused by yeast. Dr. Michael is the founder of the Biamonte Center for Clinical Nutrition and the co-creator of BioCybernetics, an unprecedented computer software program that is able to study blood work, mineral tests, and many other lab tests to determine exactly where your body is imbalanced. Initially designed for aerospace purposes, he is the author of the Candida Chronicles, which I just ordered, by the way, which details its history, causes symptoms, its effect on human health and treatments. I am so excited for you to learn all about him and Candida. So let's go and say hello to Dr. Michael. Hi, Dr. Michael. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. So for the listeners that don't know you yet, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm also a New York State certified clinical nutritionist. And I began my um, journey in natural health quite some years ago in the 80s when I was, um, after I came out of naturopathic school, I was working with a group of researchers at Grumman Aerospace to develop a computer model, like a software program that would analyze different tests like blood work and things, and would be able to tell you what nutrients a person needed, or it actually to be more specific, it was a computer model of the human body. It's still the only one that I know that exists. So we basically took everything it, the way to explain it was like we took Harper's biochemistry and um, books on physiology and loaded them all into a computer software program so that the, the computer could run a facsimile of someone's body if you gave it the proper lab work. And we were doing this as um, contractors for NASA because this was a project that NASA gave Grumman, Grumman Aerospace. So this group of doctors, including myself, inherited this from Grumman and they said here's the project you know do it this is your budget you know go ahead and do it so we we worked at this for a few years and we put together a working model of the body which was amazing because you could give this computer software program like different data you could even you could give it blood tests you could even give it chiropractic adjustment points that the person was was having done uh, frequently you can give it all kinds of data and it would use that data to mock up a simulation of the body the more data you gave it, the more accurate it was. So we started to use it um, on test people, test clients. So back in those days, there weren't that many supplement companies like there are now. This was like in the early 80s. We had Nutridyne and um, some other companies. You didn't have all the companies like you have now. But we, we loaded in a, um, a product module, which had standard process supplements and various other supplements and the, the computer would run the simulation of the body, find what was wrong, and then look to the product module to find what supplement would solve the problem. So we started doing this on people as a, as a test, and people were getting all kinds of problems help, help, uh, removed or healed, like asthma, arthritis. All these things were being handled by actually manipulating or correcting their actual biochemistry quite different than what we're used to so we're used to you go to the doctor you say i have a pain in my neck the doctor gives you the pill that says pain on the neck pill and you mm-hmm. take that and it numbs the pain and you're you know you're drugged out and you don't know the difference this is quite different here we're actually correcting the underlying cause of what the person's body problem was by handling their biochemistry imbalances very different than what most people are used to when watching television and watching commercials especially when they go through the 10 minute list of the possible side effects so anyway we did this we had this going it was going really well and nasa then told grumman that it was too expensive because we were they ultimately wanted to take this this um this software and run the program on the astronauts when they were in the space station, like when they were out in the space station for months and months, because you have a problem in in, um, zero gravity, you have calcium problems. Because you're in zero gravity, minerals in your body don't operate the way they should, especially calcium, and you get a lot of bone loss. You get protein loss and muscle wasting when you're in space for a long time. So their plan was to use this 
as a complete tool to figure out what the astronauts needed nutritionally to keep them in balance. But it got too expensive. So they said, you know, we have to cut this. So our first reaction was, wow, you know, we just spent three years doing this. We have a, we had a, a core of five doctors who were at the helm of this, but we had other doctors who were like on, on board sending us all kinds of information and, and data. And we said, well, what do we do with this thing? They said, we don't care, keep it. So we walked off and we started a corporation called BioCybernetics. Um, BioCybernetics means like the study of self-regulating biological mechanisms, because that's technically what it would be if you broke it down to the derivation. Bio means biologic, cybernetics is the study of self-regulating mechanisms, like robots and stuff like that. So we decided we took this and we started marketing it to doctors. We said, you know, here, send us your patient's blood work, send us the tests, and we'll send you back this, you know, 50 page report. The computer is going to tell you everything that's wrong and right with their physiology. And it's going to give you a list of supplements and a diet for them to follow. And this was very, very successful until I started to notice there was about 30% of the people had weird reactions to the supplements. This didn't make sense. They took the supplements and they felt sick. They had headaches. They had all kinds of problems. So I volunteered to find out what was wrong with these people. So I started studying all their lab work, looking for some kind of common denominator. And eventually, I make a long story short, what I eventually found out is all of these people had candida. Mm. And candida interacts really strange with vitamins or drugs. When people who have candida or any kind of gut imbalance, any kind of dysbiosis, whether it's parasites or SIBO or whatever, when they take vitamins, they get strange reactions because these microorganisms interact with the nutrients and they produce toxicities of all kinds. So I didn't really know much about candida. This is like 1986, 87. I didn't know much about candida. I looked it up in a, in a textbook and it, I knew, understood it was a fungus and it was a fungus that could convert itself to a yeast. It was, they called it dimorphic, meaning two lives. It could be a yeast or a fungus and switch itself back and forth. So I said, well, this is interesting. So I, so I told the people, I said, go to your doctors, tell them you have candida, let them cure you, and then come back to us and we'll put you on the vitamin programs, how naive I was back then. So they came back and they said, well, the doctor says candida doesn't exist, or it does exist, but it really doesn't matter. And I don't have a yeast in, vaginal yeast infection, so it doesn't make any difference. And all of these stories. So I said, this is not going to work. So at the time, I was in Manhattan, and I said, told them, I want you to go see Dr. Hoffman or Dr. Atkins or one of the, uh, the, the known, well-known functional doctors of, of that era. You see? Those were the guys who were the big holistic doctors back then. You had Dr. Uh, Ronald Hoffman, and we had Dr. Atkins, Bob like Atkins. The, the Dr. Atkins, Atkins diet doctor? Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, cool. Yeah. I knew him pretty well. I knew Dr. Hoffman pretty well. And um, so I said, well, go to them. I know these guys at least know what they're talking about. And I saw that they had written articles. And I saw in Dr. Atkins' book, he said that one of the things that would prevent his diet from working would be if you had candida. So I know that he knew about this. So I said, go to those guys and tell them you have candida. Tell them I sent you and get cured. Then come back and we'll put you back on the program. Well, a month or two later, they came back and they said, well, this was much better an experience. They said they knew about this. And they gave me niastatin or they gave me these drugs and they gave me this diet and I was better for a while, but then everything just relapsed. I said, that's crazy. I said, I, I can't understand why that happened. So I started studying about candida and um, all these years later, I'm now a recognized expert on the subject because I, I basically reversed engineered what candida did to people. And all the data on my research and the protocols and what to do is in my book called the Candida Chronicles. And it basically takes you through the whole journey that I went through to understand Candida. Because there's people, when you go on the internet, go on YouTube, you're going to see all these different people have all these different ways of trying to handle Candida. And what I eventually found out by having a lot of those people come to me as patients is what they arrived at was something that worked for them. So they then tried to do it on everybody. And that doesn't work because everyone's candy, everyone's candida situation is different. It's unique based on their environment, based on their diet, based on their genetics, 
based on their own biochemistry, which gets influenced by their diet and also by other things that creep in, like their, their mineral balance or toxic metals accumulation that they could get. Even someone's dental status can affect can the, the drugs that you take, you're prescribed by your doctor affected. So there, there's so many things that could affect how candida operates in one person versus someone else that I had to take the whole thing apart and then break it down and then come up with how you really handle it and to, uh, to make it an actual workable protocol that really was something that was scientific and that you could duplicate the results. Not a cookie cutter program. We don't give everybody the same program. What's unique about what I do is we have certain tests that we run on the person to help us define their, their exact candida case and that tell us then what protocols will work and which won't work on them. Oh, interesting. So do you diagnose this through blood or? How no, it's mostly it? through urine and urine and stool tests. Blood tests don't really help you that much um, initially. They can help you later on to understand some of the, um, let's say, the, the disrelated problems that are going on, but not directly. Directly to understand candida, you either use a stool test or a, or a special urine test or both. And the, the, what's so interesting about candida nowadays, it, it has a, a, a new modern face to it, because I'm finding out that COVID causes candida in people, not so much the Omicron strain, but the earlier strains that were more devastating, they actually can cause candida. And what's also interesting is the, the COVID vaccine can cause candida on, in people. So I found that to be very interesting because we have had people who, let's say, graduated from our treatment a few years ago, now coming back saying, gee, you know, I think it, I had COVID or I had the vaccine. It's, I think the candida is coming back. So it's giving us a new look, a new face on it in, in that sense. But we know that nowadays we know candida is very far reaching. So we would estimate that at any given time, 30% of the U.S. population has candida. Now, candida primarily is caused by the use of antibiotics. Antibiotics is what primarily will give most people candida, whether you're taking probiotics or not. When, when you take an antibiotic and a probiotic, basically the antibiotic kills the probiotic. And once mm -hmm. it does that, and this is whether you're taking it orally or just the probiotics actually in your body, the antibiotics kill the probiotics and the, you have a balance that's there. Um, this is where the word or the term dysbiosis comes from. Dysbiosis is an umbrella term, which means you have an imbalance between the good bacteria in your intestines and all the bad organisms like parasites, bad bacteria, candida, yeasts, things like this. So once you develop this imbalance, candida starts to take over and you start to go through the cycle of getting these symptoms. You, you first start to feel fatigued and like just not really yourself then you could start getting cognitive disorders where you don't remember things now. Then you start getting bloating, gas, digestive problems. Now you can start getting allergies. You start getting rashes. You start getting food allergies. You start getting airborne allergens. Then as it goes on and on and on, you can develop asthma. And eventually the worst situation, the worst possible thing that can happen with, with a person with candida is they become what we used to call a universal reactor. This is somebody who is so toxic and they are so environmentally challenged that they really can't even leave the house without having all kinds of headaches and symptoms. They could not walk down the aisle in the supermarket where you have your cleaning solutions without feeling sick. Wow. They can't, they can't go to a bar where people are smoking and wearing perfume. They can't handle it. Their immune system just gets overloaded. That's probably the ultimate thing that can happen to a person with candida. Wow, that's crazy. So yeah. how do you know, like just like a regular healthy person, you know, you think you're healthy on the, you feel good. How yeah. would you know if you have candida? It's hard. It's hard unless you do some research. But what would a woman who has vaginal yeast infections, we automatically know she has candida to some degree because a vaginal yeast infection is like the tip of the iceberg. There's more yeast in her body. It's just at this point recognizable vaginally. But there's to have a vaginal yeast infection, you have to also have an overgrowth of yeast in your intestine. Men who have jock itch or, or yeast in the groin, very similar concept. Someone to figure out if they have candida would have to look back at their history. They'd have to think like, when was the last time I took an antibiotic or I took a steroid or I was on some kind of medication. And then how did I feel after that point? 
So if they start recognizing symptoms of candida that occurred a few months after taking an antibiotic or a steroid or some kind of medication, even antacids can cause candida. So you'd have, this is how you'd have to look at it. You have to be a little bit of a detective and say, gee, you know, I have this group of symptoms. They fall into the, into the bag of candida. Now, when did they start? And what did I do prior to that? So then the person, you'll suddenly see the person light up and they'll say, wow, I was on antibiotics for my, my, my dental work at that time. Or the doctor had to give me a steroid because I hurt myself in the gym. Or I got into that car accident. You see, mm -hmm. they'll start to pull it together and then you can, then you can make sense out of it on a, on a timeline basis. Because to, um, to just assume is not a good idea. You've got to actually, actually and factually put together your own timeline of events and what happened and then see if you started to develop the symptoms afterwards. Of course, you could always just go get tested for it. But um, if someone's just sitting there thinking about this, that's what they'd have to think. What happened? What was the result? How did I feel? Okay. And is, are there certain foods or things that feed it that make it proliferate? Yes. Candida loves sugar. It loves, it loves sugar. So it, it doesn't make any difference whether it's um, uh, something like a, a health food store cookie from the best health food store in the world, or if it's a yodel that you pick up from the side of the road, it just loves sugar. It doesn't make any difference what kind of sugar it is and starch too, because starches break down to sugars. So it feeds on carbs and sugars is what candida likes. It loves maltose, which means it loves beer. And um, it can feed on a lot of alcohols, but particularly beer because of the high maltose. So a lot of people have what they say are beer allergies. They really have candida. Oh, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. And what, how long does it usually take to clear it up? Like on um, average? Six months to a year, depending on the person's schedule and their lifestyle. Okay, that's a long time. Well, that's because candida is a plant. So that's one of the things you can miss about this plant. Candida is actually a plant as a fungus or a yeast. It grows roots into your intestinal tract looking for sugar. So it's literally like having a plant growing, growing inside of you. So it's not something that's going to go away easily. See, because that plant has roots and you can go on a, a fast, you can starve the candida. And if you can imagine it as a plant, it, it will whittle whittle itself down to just this little thing but the roots are still there mm. so once you go off the fast and you start eating again it starts to grow again wow. so you have you have to kill it right down to the roots and that's what's hard that's what's hard about it like a lot of people you'll see them on facebook or on different community chats there are lots of um uh, uh what, do you, what would you call them again i don't remember the name right now there's a lot of people online talking about like forums or whatever forums exactly and there'll be they'll be exchanging information about this product that product this doctor this diet and one of the things they fail to really understand is this is like having a, a plant growing inside your system so if you don't really know how to handle it it's never going to go away you'll just manage it you'll be on a like a very strict diet for the rest of your life trying to keep it under control but then the moment you go off the diet or usually three to three to five days after you after you go off the diet it's growing again and it's releasing mycotoxins it's releasing alcohol it's releasing all of these chemicals into your body that affect your nervous system it's very common that autistic kids develop candida it's one of the attributes of an autistic kid it's not just that they have mercury toxicity from thimerosal and the the, uh, the vaccinations they develop candida Mm hmm. Wow. You know, speaking of that, it's totally off topic, but I did hear, do you know who Dr. Judy Mikovits is? Mm -hmm. She was talking about Suramin helps with autism. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? Yeah, I have. I've, I've been investigating that. I find that interesting. Yeah, I'll say. Mm -hmm. I mean, I live in California. My best friend is like in special ed, um, you know, education and I tell her this kind of stuff and she's like, yeah, whatever, Tracy, that's not true. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, keep in, keep in mind that most schools receive in their budget extra money for every kid they have who's autistic, who's put on drugs. Mm -hmm. If you have a child who's in a school 
and he's diagnosed as autistic and he's given drugs, prescribed drugs, that school gets extra money to help manage that kid. So well, I'm not surprised. There you go again, pharmaceutical mafia. So let me ask you, you, kind of going way back. So did what made you choose naturopathic medicine? I mean, I it's not as common, right? Especially back then. So back then there were only two naturopathic schools left. Um, in the in the seventies and eighties, when I went to school, because the pharmaceutical industry basically wiped them all out. Mm-hmm. Now, in the last twenty or thirty years, we have I think there's ten or six, to eight, somewhere between ten to sixteen naturopathic schools. But just about every university you go to offers some kind of clinical nutrition program. Now it's turned around totally because you know nutrition is the end thing; it's the chic thing. All the celebrities are going to a nutritionist. You know, they're, who's taking vitamins, who's doing colonics, who's doing this and that. So now it's the end thing. So now the education is far more available and you can do it at home. One of the um, uh, receptionists in my office for years has been working as a, a clinical nutritionist part-time and she's been studying on the internet at home to get her, her degree. So it's wi- widely available now compared to back when I was in school. When I was in school, my day consisted of going to the library and being there all day studying because you didn't have the internet in those days. Well, and here's a question for you. The clinical nutrition program that these people are going through right now, do they, do they learn the government nutrition guidelines? There's two types of nutritionists. There's the... I have, to, I have to be careful here, but there's the type of nutritionist you find in institutions, um, hospitals, nursing homes. These are the people I used to call jello mongers. They write, basically write up the diets for the people who are in these homes. And they're, they're more in food service management. Their gig is they have to know how to order food and provide food for hundreds of people in this institution. That's food service management. They're called dietitians. They've been at war with the clinical nutritionists, and we're we're kind of looked at as we're the health food store nutritionists. They've been at war with us for years because they want the term nutritionist because they have so muddied and soiled the term dietitian by doing what they do because they're not really nutritionists. Like as I'm saying before, they're food service management. They have to know how you order a, how much rice you order for 300 people in the hospital. That's so two different disciplines. It's so much so that in New York state, many years ago, when they, first, well, in the nineties, when they first started certifying nutritionists, governor Cuomo, the, the original governor Cuomo, not the son, the original governor Cuomo uh, made the nutrition board d- designate whether or not it was a dietitian or a clinical nutritionist, because he stated in a letter to the board that these disciplines are so different. And he was very nice in how he, not like I am, he was very nice about how he explained it. He said, you have one group that's you know working institutionally to feed these ill people. And you have another group that's working therapeutically as an adjunct to a medical doctor or, or something else in a clinical setting to try to help these people resolve their disease. And they have to be differentiated. Mm, good. That's good because I've had clients come to me that were working with their dietitian in their doctor's office. And instead of getting them off of certain foods, they were just telling them how much um, insulin to give them. And in 90 days, I can just get them off of all their stuff, you know? Exactly. So, or yeah, 90 days or less. So anyway, that differentiation. Okay. So Pretend that you're in New York, I'm in California, and somebody here wants to do a test. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been on a very low, I've been on a ketogenic diet for like six years. So I'm not worried about me having candida. But right, if right. one of our listeners who lives in a different state, do you take remote clients or do we, they have to come to New York? We actually only do remote. Oh. I did the I did the first consultation by phone I think in 1986 or something like that, and um, it was because that's this one couple that I had that was seeing they they had parents that lived in Texas they couldn't find a nutritionist there 
So I started consulting them by phone. I had their medical doctor do the, the blood work or whatever tests I need, sent it to me. And then I just handled them by phone. And it's been growing and growing ever since to the point where that's all we do now. We, we only do phone or internet consultations. And we do it all that way. We have labs all over the country that can service the patients that we're hooked up with. So um, it's that's that's daily business for us is doing people long distance. Oh, that's perfect. That is great. Do you live still in the city or where, do, where are you located now? I'm actually a Florida resident. I've been a Florida resident for many years, but I was born in New York and I originated my practice there. Mm. But being, being that we do consultations by phone or by internet really doesn't make any difference where I am. Yeah, that's cool. It's much nicer weather in Florida. Absolutely. <laughs> my oldest son lives in the East Village and he's freezing right now. <laughs> Really, I can imagine there's they're uh, getting snow. I understand up there. Yeah, it's snowing today. Uh -huh. So, but he loves the social life. So whatever. Um, <laughs> so what? If, let's talk a little bit about your book. So, say one of the listeners decides they want to start with purchasing your book. What will that help them with? Well, when they when they read the book and they go through it from top to bottom, they're going to understand the condition. Um, they're going to understand also how you treat the condition correctly, because that's the biggest thing. You can go online and you have so many different opinions of what you do and how you treat it. And, and none of them really work. They don't work because first of all, the person is not doing any testing. They're not doing scientific testing to document. They have candida in the first place and then document when it's actually gone. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the key thing. Someone, when someone goes through my process, they're going to go through this knowing their test results, watching their test results change as they do it. And then when they get to the end, they're going to see the test is going to say, you don't have it anymore. So oh. that's, that's really a key. Because most of these people self-treat based on symptoms. Huh. Like with, with leaky gut syndrome as an example, which is um, a, a disease that's associated to candida. Candida often causes leaky gut because of those roots I was talking about before. The candida as a, as a plant is growing these roots. These roots are permeating through your intestinal tract, looking to tap into your capillaries to get blood sugar so that the candida stays alive. Now that, that's leaky gut right there. That's causing leaky gut. Those roots breaking in there. And we get people who will come to us and they'll tell me, they'll sit down, they'll say, I have the worst leaky gut that you've ever seen as a patient. I've been treating my leaky gut for 10 years and I've gotten nowhere with this. So there's one question I asked him, have you tested to see if you have leaky? I don't have to test. I know I have it. I have all the symptoms, blah, blah, blah. And often we test them and we find out they don't have it. They're confusing <laughs> candida symptoms with the symptoms of leaky gut. So if the key thing is that the person get tested so that you know what you're doing. You're not just treating symptoms. You have to know what you're doing. And then you have to have protocols that work, which are all explained in my book. I want to give you one example. A major discovery that I made once in the beginning of my um, research, and I, I touched on this a little bit before, um, when you have a candida patient, you give him Nystatin or you give him ketoconazole, or one of the pharmaceuticals for candida, and he takes it every day. What happens at around day 21, the candida starts to mutate and it starts to become drug resistant against the drug. Now, to, to the degree that it becomes drug resistant is to the degree where the person will stop noticing improvements. So usually they hit 21 days. Now the whole thing starts. The mother cells of the candida start to import data to the daughter cells, explaining how to change your metabolism so the drug doesn't bother you anymore. Now, in about two months after that, the person now is not getting any benefit from the drug at all because the candida is now genetically mutated. It may have gone from being candida albicans, which is the most common that everybody knows about, into candida tropicalis or candida galbrata or a drug resistant uh, strain of candida. Now the person's taking the medication and they're totally relapsing. All their old symptoms are coming back. This, it's like they're doing nothing. The candida is now immune to the drug. So what I discovered you have to do to stop that is you have to rotate your antifungals. So we will choose for the patient usually four or five different natural herbal antifungals and have them switch them every four or five days and just keep cycling through them 
until they have done their their job and they've removed the amount of candida we expect for that phase of the of the treatment. Okay, that's cool. I like that. So that you sh- people should be doing that with their food too. Um, okay, so what if they don't want to go to their regular doctor? Can you order their labs for them? First of all, they shouldn't go to their regular doctor because he's not going to, unless he reads my book and studies with me, he's not going to know what he's doing. That's the first thing. So yes, we can, we handle all the lab work. Oh, we okay. All the lab work. Because I heard you earlier say that you have their regular doctor send over their blood work. And then I'm thinking. Yeah, that was 30 years ago. Oh, okay. When I was first starting out doing the phone consultations. We don't have to do that anymore because via the internet, there are so many labs all over the country that we've hooked up with. So wherever the person is, we can get the lab work done that they need. Okay, cool. Even in Hawaii. Even in Hawaii. Yeah. Why is that? Is that not normal? <laughs> well, it's a little bit off the beaten track. Okay, got it. But we do have patients there and we're hooked up with the labs there. So anywhere the person is, we can get the lab work done. Awesome. Problem is overseas. Internationally, it's a little harder. So what else besides Candida do you guys work on? I mean, is there other conditions? Thyroid. Heavily thyroid. And the reason why is because candida and thyroid are two things which come together. Candida interferes with thyroid function and thyroid function when it's poor, makes you more susceptible to candida. Oh, I should have one of my clients reach out to you. I have a client who she does everything that everybody else does and she has bad thyroid. She has, um, you know, hypothyroid. And she has everything that all my other clients do, and she cannot drop weight. Even when she took a break, her weight didn't even go up. She's just stuck. Many thyroid patients have candida, and the candida is interfering with their thyroid. But if we're going to erase candida for a second and just look at thyroid, one of the key things that I do that 99% of the endocrinologists or thyroid specialists know nothing about is we balance the thyroid hormone receptor sites in the body in order to get the hormone working. 90% of all doctors who delve into thyroid, endocrinologists, thyroid specialists, whatever, they understand thyroid from the viewpoint of the blood work they do, which, which limits them to what's, what they're seeing in the blood. They see hormone levels of what the body's producing. They see hormone levels of what they're giving the patient in a pill, That's what they know. When the thyroid hormone is in your bloodstream, what it does to work is it enters a a chemical process in your cells that's called the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain is how the hormone goes into your cells and actually interacts with ATP to get your, your cells, the mitochondria in your cells to act like little furnaces and, and combust the food you eat into heat and energy. That's the end result of thyroid for the most part is the production of heat and energy. Now, thyroid hormones also stimulate your liver to detoxify. They also do other things, but the primary thing is heat and energy in your cells. Now, when the thyroid hormone enters that electron transport chain, there are receptor sites there, like targets that the hormone has to hit in order to to work. Those receptor sites are governed based on minerals. Now, here's where you lose the doctors completely. They're based on minerals. And the, to, the simple breakdown of, the, of this is that calcium and the mineral copper act as antagonists or governors to stop an overreaction or an oversensitivity of the thyroid hormone. Otherwise, you'd be hyperthyroid. Zinc and potassium are in the cells or the opposition. They want to sensitize your tissues. So in order to have your cells react properly to thyroid hormone and be sensitive in the correct manner, not overly sensitive, not underly sensitive, you have to have a correct balance in the cells of copper and calcium versus zinc and potassium. Mm. And when you get those things in balance, then everything works. Many years ago, a doctor named Broda Barnes wrote this phenomenal book called Hypothyroidism, the Unsuspected Illness. And the whole, the whole concept of the book by Barnes is that people are walking around out there who are all hypothyroid and they don't know it because their doctor's going by their blood work. The doctor's not looking at their body temperatures. And Barnes said, here's the range of body temperatures. If you're below 97.8, you are functionally hypothyroid. I don't care what your blood work says. If you're above 98.2, you're fine. If you're in between there, that's a gray area. 
But if you're below 97.8, you are functionally hypothyroid. I'm looking mine up right now. Okay. I have an aura ring and it tells me every day what my, um, oh, it just said not, minus 0.2. Shoot, I'm going to have to look. Um, yeah, it's not telling me. Okay. Well, well, it's not something new. We all know that 98.6 is your normal body temperature orally. Now, most of us, most doctors who do this type of approach, we have the person uh, use their, their axillary temperature, which is under the armpit. And we're looking for above 98.2 as the baseline. That wow. tells us you're okay. If you're, but if you're below 97.8, as Barnes explains in the book, you're functionally hypothyroid because you're not producing enough heat. Mm. And, why, and why that is, see the what what barnes observed and barnes noticed is based on this other data i'm giving you of the cellular receptors barnes didn't know about this in those days barnes uh, said well what you have to do is treat the person by giving them synthroid or giving give them thyroid hormone because that will jack them up and get the temperature up and that that's true it does do that but it's not working for the right reason it's like you're sort of ramming the hormone in there rather than just gently adjusting your receptors so that it works more smoothly but that's what it's based on this is where this is why there's so many people so many people who are being treated for thyroid and they there's the same story i always hear from them the doctor has me on the thyroid medication i feel better when i take it but i still don't feel right there's something missing and this is, this is what's missing, is that the receptor sites are not in balance. So they're not getting the full use of the thyroid medication, if you want to look at it from that viewpoint. So it's those four minerals that need to be balanced is basically. So do you, so going back to the, the really cool software that you guys were using, where you would enter you know, the person's blood, the patient's blood, and mm-hmm. you can see everything. Do you guys still do something similar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we still use it for the thing. Um, the software has been advanced every year we add more data to it as we learn and it, it becomes more and more advanced so it still exists still in use but there's um there are a couple of other things about the thyroid issue that you wouldn't think uh, one of them is mercury it's one of the major things we find wrong with thyroid patients is they're mercury toxic this is something their doctor would never look at because mercury stores in your thyroid gland and it impedes the production of the hormone and it also interferes with those cellular receptors I was telling you about. It blocks them. Mm. So mercury toxicity is a, is a heavy thing with thyroid patients, a very common problem. Interesting. And so many people want to get the mercury fillings out, but their doctors don't do it safely. Yes, this is a problem. You know? Um, yeah, it's a problem. It's... um. Minimally, when a, when a dentist does this, he has to use this device called a rubber dam that he puts in your mouth that prevents you from swallowing a lot of the mercury. The, there are many different methodologies on this, but the, the dentist who doesn't know anything about this at all, and he's just going to drill your mouth and pull out the fillings, that's not good. In fact, when I, when I first started a practice, when I first started a practice, one of my first patients was a dentist. And he came to me, referred, he, re, he was referred to me by an oral surgeon friend of mine. And this, this fellow had diarrhea really bad. He told me that he has diarrhea constantly. He has to live on pasta and, um, and long, white, long grain white rice and bananas and all these things to bind himself up. And he didn't know what was wrong. He said he went to all of these gastroenterologists. No one could find out why he has this diarrhea. I tested him and I found that he was wildly mercury toxic. One of the symptoms of mercury toxicity happens to be diarrhea. Ooh, I have another friend I should send to you. She, I mean, it's really bad. It's really bad. And she's been on so many medications. For diarrhea? Um, um, No, just throughout her whole life, like steroids and just so many different medications from asthma. She has lupus and all different things. So she's autoimmune. She has asthma. She has lupus. We know automatically she's autoimmune. Right. And what a lot of when you talk to functional medical doctors today and you ask them what's at the basis of most autoimmune conditions, we go back to the the biome, the gut biome. There's a disturbance there. It's usually a parasite or candida 
that's generating them. And how autoimmune conditions generally uh, come about is you either you develop something like candida or parasites or a combination, they cause leaky gut syndrome. And then from that point, you then become autoimmune. And however, the autoimmunity uh, expresses itself at that point is going to be based on your genetics. Mm. Yeah, that's crazy. She had that for a long time. Boy, you're just a wealth of information. I love it. So let's go back to the mercury thing, because I think that that is a big, big, big problem because, you know, first of all, they used to pack our mouths with it. Second of all, now people are becoming more aware and they're realizing that they shouldn't. And then also you mentioned about the autism and stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of this in your clinic? Yeah, I um, at one time treated Jenny McCarthy's son and, and, and Jenny. I know Jenny personally. I treated her son. And she had invited me uh, several years in a row to go to her convention, Autism One in Chicago. And I um, spoke there and lectured, got a lot of autistic patients from there. So got a really good firsthand look at what was really going on in their biochemistry. And I wrote an article about autism which I think this one article is worth a textbook because it really explains how it all occurs. First thing that has to happen to have an autistic child is genetically, they have to be a bad detoxifier. Now, when you do a 23andMe test or one of these genetic tests, there are certain SNPs that you will find that are indications of your, your methylation and detoxification being impaired. So that's the first thing you have to have. So you have to have impaired detoxification. Now, the next thing that happens is you get hit with vaccinations. You get a lot of these vaccinations that have thimerosal, which is supposed to be illegal now. It's not supposed to be allowed anymore. But granted, let's say that you become mercury toxic because we can interchange thimerosal with mercury toxicity because it's both the same thing. Thimerosal is basically a mercury preservative they would put in the vaccines, right? So you have, you have a kid, he has impaired detoxification, and now he becomes exposed to toxins like mercury or whatever. Let's say he lives in an old brownstone in Manhattan that has old copper plumbing, old. Mm -hmm. right? The copper plumb, the copper is leaching out of the plumbing. Okay, fine. You said mold. Definitely. He's exposed to mold. So now he, his body becomes overwhelmed with toxicity that he can't get rid of. He starts to develop candida. He develops leaky gut syndrome. And basically his nervous system becomes overwhelmed by all these toxins. That is an autistic kid. He develops allergies, the whole thing. There's a whole profile with these kids of physical symptoms that they typically have. Asthma, allergies are very common in that, in that realm. And that's how it all starts. You have to first start out with the bad genes. Then you get overwhelmed by toxins. Then you develop candida leaky gut. And then you could take it from there. Have you seen any of them be able to reverse symptoms? Absolutely. All of them. I, think, I don't think I have, um, I think 95% of all the kids I've ever treated, we've been able to re reverse the problems, but you have to remember we're handling the physical end. If you have a, like a kid who's 10 years old and you reverse the physical reasons for autism, it's not like his whole education now snaps all of a sudden back into his brain. He has to, he has to be retaught. Now you have a situation where now learning is possible without the physical interference. Mm, mm-hmm. Well, hey, it's a start. What is the most common ailment that you see plaguing women? That I see in my practice personally, it's menstrual irregularities due to having candida or due to having um, hormone imbalances. Okay. And so if they have hormone imbalances, what do you find is the cause of it or like... How do you like to treat it? Often the cause is candida. Sometimes the, sometimes the cause is, is are mineral imbalances, like very commonly women who are copper toxic, which, which happens quite frequently. When copper builds up, and it, it builds up for a few reasons, copper and estrogen have a shared domain. Um, copper is an estrogenic mineral. It, sens it sensitizes your tissues to the effects of estrogen. And copper is also involved in the production and the release of estrogen in the body. So if a woman gains too much copper, and that can happen for a few reasons, it can happen from being a vegetarian because vegetarian diets are very high in copper. So if she's eating a, a very high copper diet 
and not not getting that in balance or has the wrong genes to be able to handle it, the copper goes up and now she's what we call estrogen dominant. And estrogen dominance is a, is a very common problem that causes hormone problems. So we could have um, the candida, we can have the copper problem. And, but you see, you know, the funny thing is a lot of these problems interrelate. Someone low thyroid. One of the purposes of thyroid hormone is to stimulate your liver and get your liver to, det to detoxify. Copper builds up in your liver. If you're, if you're low thyroid, you start to accumulate copper you see, and the reverse can happen too. If you become, if you become exposed to large amounts of copper, the copper suppresses your thyroid. So it can happen either way. It's, 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 oh, it's it like this. How it, what's that? Chain reaction. Both yes. directions. Wow. Yes, that, that's, that's true. And that's well, the way I'm, the universe works. Yeah. The body, say, your I'm body's in the surprised. universe. So it's not, yeah. Yeah. That is cool. Wow. So how can people find you? Like if, if people are like, oh my gosh, I need to figure out what's going on with me, really? How can they yeah. find you? They can just go online and, and uh, do a search for New York City Candida Doctor or the New York City Thyroid Doctor. Okay. And what about how do they get your book? They go on Amazon, like everything else. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to shop on Amazon. I'd rather buy directly from the manufacturer if I could. Yeah, I like uh, mom and pop businesses. I try to support them, but it is what it is. Yeah, I think we're going back there, though. I really, really do. I really think we're going to see more, you know, grassroots, back to basics, you know, old school lifestyle in the near future. I would hope so. Yeah, I think it'll be good. I'm looking forward to it. Yep. Well, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Michael, for coming on the show. It's like, you are so smart. It's really fun to chat with you. I've been doing this a while, so I've picked up some tricks. Awesome. That's great. Okay. That was absolutely awesome. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm super excited to read the book and get started on improving my health and seeing if I have candida or not. So for complete show notes, head on over to highenergygirl.com forward slash show, where you will also find links to order the book as well as to contact Dr. Michael. So if you so desire, all right, you guys, thank you so much for listening. Make it a great day. Bye for now. This podcast contains the opinion and thoughts of its host and guests. It is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subjects covered. All statements made on the podcast have not been evaluated by the FDA and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. If the listener requires professional assistance or advice, please contact your personal medical doctor. Both host and guests specifically disclaim any responsibility for any liability, loss, or risk personal or otherwise, which is incurred as a consequence directly or indirectly of the use and application of any of the contents of these episodes. Like I said, this is my opinion and I could be wrong.